When I thought about doing a presentation of myself as an artist, I reflected on what it meant to me to be a visual person through a long life. So the first part of this presentation is about my visual life as a child and what I looked at. And the next part is about the art I did in Bali while living there uh, for a few years as a mat mature artist. And the third part is about the exploration I did in the process of making a final project for the Art cl Cloth Mastery Program with Jane Dunawald. So this is me at about eight. And as children, we don't get to choose our parents. We don't get to choose our locations. We just get what we get. And we respond very directly to anything that's in our path. Um, so what I was able to have was to live in Manhattan from about the ages of four until 12. And this is the block where we lived. It's uh, Riverside Drive, 114th Street. And uh, my mother was a writer, and my father was getting his PhD in art history. And I was able to see a lot of really great things while I was living there. So the very first passion I really remember was that I loved dance. And I don't know when it started. It just seemed to always have been. And I was able to take classes at the American Ballet Theater in Manhattan. And I think what I really loved about dance was just this beautiful composition and form and the interaction of the craft of ballet with the body and uh, the elegance that it created. And this is a dancer performing from the New York City Ballet. And also, of course, the movement and the energy that you could see in dance. Um, this is a piece that I did in 2013 that reminds me of that. Uh, it's Thermofax on Shibori that I did in a workshop with Jane Dunawald. And of course, I really loved seeing the costumes. Um, there was so much to look at, beautiful ornament, incredible color and texture. So the other opportunity I had was to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art pretty frequently. I went there with my father and he would do research and I would be left to just roam. And uh, for some reason, for quite a while, I remember this second passion, which was that I was very fixated on Egyptian art. And I think I just really felt the power of that art and uh, the symmetry also. and the elegance, and there was this tremendous mystery. And the symbols were otherworldly, the colors were very unusual, um, and it just felt very adventurous to me. So this is a piece I did uh, in my 20s in the 1970s, and it's Nefertiti playing a game. Uh, it's 14 by 14, and it's a boutique. And as I reflected on it, I saw similarities between the two forms. This um, beautiful elegance and composition, um, something very clear, and um, something also uh, a little otherworldly. Another opportunity that I had was in the summertime. Uh, we would take the whole summer in Rhode Island with my grandparents. And um, I really loved swimming in the ocean, which was not far from the, our house. And I just was able to uh, really feel my senses and be in nature. And this is a painting I did in 2010. So this is the house that my grandparents uh, lived in and we stayed in. And it was, as you can see, a very big old house that was built in the 1880s. Um, it had seen much better days. And uh, so it was a relic. But in a way, that was even better because it was full of treasures from the past. And my grandmother uh, allowed us to wander and to just be children and experience our imaginations in the house. And she was also very nurturing. Uh, the house was full of great, um, lots of great books, old books. And my grandfather was a poet and a translator. And 
he uh, also wrote reviews, and this is actually something I found on eBay, one of his reviews for the Saturday Review in the 1940s. And among all these old books were some really beautiful uh, children's books, a lot of fairy books, and uh, this one is uh, full of illustrations by Edmund Dulac, and I think that my mother and her sisters had poured over this book. These were older books, so they also had that sense of mystery. This is an illustration uh, by Edmund Dulac from the book um, The Arabian Nights series, and again, you can see this um, curvilinear arabesque form, um, beautiful, interesting colors, um, something exotic that would have compelled a child. Um, this is another illustrator, uh, Kaya Nielsen, who was um, uh, a Danish-American illustrator. This is for the East for east of the Sun and West of the Moon, um, and very Art Deco influenced. So both of these illustrators were from this golden age of illustration in the late 1880s to the 1920s. So also in the house, um, I was I was surrounded by uh, William Morris wallpaper in a number of rooms, and um, I loved these curvilinear botanical forms and patterns, and again, really interesting muted colors. This is another oil painting I did uh, of begonias in 2010. Another example of these muted colors and forms that I really liked, and uh, a katagami piece uh, on the right uh, in natural dyes. So a couple of years ago, I was able to get into the house um, and take some pictures. Uh, the new owners were very generous. And I uh, enjoyed exploring, again, these uh, curvilinear kind of Victorian forms, um, the ornamental parts of the architecture. Uh, and this is, a, um, this is the tower in the back, but it's uh, where the staircase is. And this is between the second and third floors. Um, and interesting windows, um, and up on the third floor again, uh, patterns in the windows and in the shingling. This is a porch where I could come up and just hang out and look, um, look down on the gardens as a kid. Uh, this is a circular window in the tower uh, going up to the third floor, and um, a shibori piece that kind of reflects that, um, that form. Uh, it's a fan shibori that I did in 2010. And as it turns out, this mandala form is very important in the story of my visual life because my grandmother was a painter of, ma of mandalas. Um, and the reason she painted mandalas is because she um, was seeing visions. She actually saw visions. She heard voices, and she also um, used her dreams as a way to kind of manage these visions. Um, they were actually very distracting and uh, difficult for her when they first started coming in her 20s. And the artwork was a form of personal therapy uh, that helped her to manage um, something that she really didn't have a lot of choice over. Um, and she did have to learn how to control them. And I think at, um, at this point, in this day and age, she probably would have been medicated. But instead, she wrote a lot of essays, explored her spiritual life, and painted these mandalas. Um, there is a little figure toward the bottom right, and she um, wrote in her journals that we have read um, that this she called the um, friend in the unconscious. And in this case, you can see that figure's in the center. Uh, so these are um, very connected to um, Tibetan mandalas, and I don't think she, in fact, I'm sure she didn't realize that when she first started painting them, but later on she connected them to Tibetan traditions, although they're still highly personal and not at all traditional in their symbol, symbolism. Uh, this is an important piece uh, for her. She said that it was um, taken very closely from a vision that she had um, when she felt quite alienated and, uh, by having these visions, and it helped her, when she had this vision, to integrate back into her daily life and manage better. Um, it's called Star Cluster, and I was particularly fond of it as a kid, and I, I showing, I'm showing this shibori, which I did in 2014, 
um, because I think it relates very much to that experience I had looking at these beautiful sparkling clusters of stars and that Shibori can achieve that with the die and the resist. So uh, we didn't get a lot of chance to look at these paintings. She only took them out occasionally, mostly on rainy days, and she would talk to us about them, but she would not talk about her condition, as she, I'm sure, thought we were too young for that. But she did talk about how she felt spiritually about them in ways that we understood as children. This is my grandmother um, in 1915. Uh, when she first met my grandfather, and this is my grandmother and grandfather in 1917 when my mother was born, and then again in 1970 as I knew her um, with my nephew uh, in again in 1970. Because I grew up in a very literary family, um, I not only uh, wrote a lot of poetry but became an English major uh, when I was in college, and I also did a lot of painting as a kid, um, and one day I uh, was leaving a poetry class, it was a spring day as I remember, um, and we had just read this beautiful poem by William Carlos Williams, The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. And I was thinking really intently on this poem, and I had been thinking about color a lot and writing about color, and I decided that I didn't want to write about color anymore, I just wanted to paint. And this is a painting I did recently. Uh, it relates a lot to the colors I was seeing in my head at the time. And so within a few weeks I, I had become a painting major. And as a painting major uh, we explored a lot of really interesting visual problems and I also had to take electives. and. I took a textile design class and we were given a few batik assignments and I remember pulling the batik out of the, the dye bath and looking at it through the light that was coming through and just being completely mesmerized by the glow of that batik and I was hooked after that. And I started to make these uh, uh, symmetrical designs that were l a lot like mandalas. This, this one is about uh, 40 by 50. They were large. And I actually got in some trouble with the painting department because my teacher felt I was being distracted by the batiks and he advised me not to take any more textile design classes. Um, I felt very pressured but and I thought he was crazy. I didn't see any problem with doing these. Uh, but he did, and so there started to become kind of a rift between my textiles very early on and my painting. I also wanted to keep painting because I thought it was a really important uh, way to understand visual art. So um, I continued to do the batiks even though I was under pressure not to do them. Um, this is a piece I think that shows that the mandalas that I saw as a kid with my grandmother were kind of inside me. And I don't think I was thinking very closely about the mandalas. This is a comparison I made as I created this presentation. I was also uh, struggling to work with the um, painting problems that we had and bringing them into my batik. But um, after I left college, uh, the batiks got even bigger. And this one is 70 by 40, uh, another mandala. And this piece um, was one of the pieces that I used images in, and it's about uh, 45 by 78. So these large pieces started to be taxing, and I actually stopped doing batik at this point because I felt I was inhaling too many, too mu much wax, too many fumes, and I didn't have the opportunity to create a studio that would make it safer. And at that point, I also had moved to California uh, for a lot of different reasons, and I rented a studio space and worked in um, the financial district. Uh, full-time and when I had time I would go to the studio and I began painting with the same dyes, uh, MX dyes, uh, fiber reactive dyes and sodium alginate and just painting very loosely and then I would sell these pieces as scarves 
And uh, I did actually do this for about nine years, and it was very meditative for me. Um, but at the end of nine years, uh, I was, one, homesick for the East Coast. Two, I wanted to go back to school and study art and kind of um, really heal this conflict I had um, in art school as an undergraduate, and I was really ready to do that. I moved to the Upper Valley, um, which is part of New Hampshire and Vermont. This is the Connecticut River, Vermont on the left, um, and New Hampshire on the right, and this is Dartmouth College. And there were a lot of reasons I wanted to settle there. Um, I did go to graduate school at Dartmouth, and they didn't have a textile program, and uh, they did have a way for me to major in painting as a graduate student. And so I took that uh, as an opportunity, and I felt good about it because I felt like painting is really key to all of my visual work because it deals with all of the basic elements of drawing, painting with color, and, um, and composition. Um, and it's a very different medium, but the principles are really important. And so um, I got a great deal out of that uh, experience majoring in painting as a graduate student. I was missing the textiles. These are uh, pieces I did uh, that were abstracts that were referring to my textiles, either scarves or perhaps more kimono panels and uh, I was translating my ideas into textiles, um, into draw for uh, textiles into drawings. And about at the end of my program, um, I started to do shibori. Joan Morris actually lives and work lives in my neighborhood and works um, at Dartmouth uh, in the theater department, and she's a very uh, well-known shibori artist as well. And uh, I started doing shibori because I could work with the dyes and not have to use wax, and also because shibori is just so beautiful. And this is a piece in the center that I did where I was really thinking about what is the difference between, in, between a shibori and a drawing other than the media. Um, so that this kind of demonstrates a, a question I had at the time. These are about, uh, from about 1994. So the next phase of this presentation is about my experience in Bali. And uh, Bali it has a climate in which things just decay. And it's also a Hindu culture. And so impermanence is a major part of the consciousness there. Um, and this is a picture of a bike that's actually been abandoned with an offering on it that's been there for a long time and the offering is just drying up and that happens a lot in Bali and the bike is probably not usable anymore and it's in a rice field uh, near a shrine and so uh, my husband and I were there because he was recruited uh, by a Canadian businessman to uh, train people to make guitars acoustic guitars. My husband is a luthier and we run a school in Vermont where we train uh, students to make acoustic guitars. And in Bali, uh, the carving is of a very high level, so this company uh, wanted someone, an expert, to train a village of carvers to make acoustic guitars and start a company there, which worked out very well. And uh, there was a really interesting collaboration between my husband and the carvers he was training because they really wanted to carve their traditional ideas and um, motifs into the guitars, so they had to work out a way that um, the guitars would be acoustically sound, which they did. So, meanwhile, I um, was very entranced with the shrines and the offerings, and this is an ancestral shrine on... Um, in the garden uh, in back of the house where we stayed, and another shrine in front of a gateway near a little neighborhood. Um, so there are many shrines everywhere and offerings happening all the time for all kinds of reasons. Um, these are, um, this is a shrine on the way to a little restaurant from our house, and um, these offerings are made out of palm leaf, and they're stitched together with threads that are pulled off of the edge of the palm leaf, so they're, it's a totally organic, very old craft. The women do it. It's called chenang, C-A-N-A-N-G, um, and they're rather time-consuming. They make a lot of them, and they just kind of let them dry out. 
So I did um, some pieces in Bali with mixed media. Oddly, I was not interested in uh, taking batik courses uh, in Bali because they were very touristy and they didn't really stimulate me. And I found bringing mixed media was um, an easy way to transport art supplies. And I had done a little bit of this work before and I was very interested in using it there. Um, I was very influenced when I was doing these pieces by the idea of impermanence and beauty, um, the beauty of the garden, the beauty of youth and ripeness. Uh, and the pieces were cohesive at the end of my time there in a way that I didn't expect because of that influence. Um, and there's a certain pathos or sadness to um, all of this because of the impermanence of life and beauty. and. Um, and it was very touching to me. But also there was, was an impermanence in the culture because Bali uh, was a very old culture that survived intact until quite late, perhaps even until the 1970s. But over the last 30 or 40 years, it's gradually been intruded upon, which is um, inevitable. And so this really beautiful Hindu culture that was very close to nature is uh, becoming more and more globalized. And I felt this great sadness about the impermanence of that and a sense of grieving that this culture that was this example of something irretrievable is just kind of um, dis disappearing in front of our eyes. And I know the Wallonese to some extent feel that. This is a piece called The Handshake. So the project ended after three years and we decided that we would not keep traveling back and forth even though that was tempting and we wanted to come back we missed the seasons we even missed winter and uh, we also needed to keep our school going and we have a beautiful place and we love being there uh, this is uh, the guitar shop in front and then the pl the residence where the students live and on the right is a a class of uh, students who just finished an acoustic guitar. And uh, I put this in because there's a sort of similarity going on between um, the guitars and the shibori at a certain point. Uh, there's a lot of clamping uh, required for uh, both wood and cloth here. And I also get to order uh, sh any shape I want from the wood shop for free for my wood blocks. This is my studio space. And uh, after Bali, I got really interested in uh, the layered work that Jane Donawal does. So I took a number of her workshops. Um, these were from a multi-screen printing class in 2013. And then in 2014, I enrolled in the, uh, her art cloth mastery program. Um, I wanted to... Um, further develop my uh, dyeing techniques with MX dyes, which is uh, one of the things that definitely gets done in the Art Cloth Mastery program. And I wanted also to explore the connections between my fine art and textiles. I, I had all, still had an ongoing question about jumping between um, those two things. And this is a shibori that I did in 2015, and this is a drawing I did while I was in graduate school. So one of the things that we uh, were expected to do in the mastery cloth, uh, art cloth mastery program uh, was to choose a theme uh, for our work for the next couple of years. And I had actually never done that. Um, I usually develop the content of my work through the process. So this is a drawing, so I might draw from life, or I might just start a collage and the meaning of um, the piece will come out through the process. And what I decided to work on um, was climate change. And I think part of that was spurred by my experience in Bali, witnessing actually a lot of damage to the environment uh, from uh, industrial age influences. And, um, and just knowing that that's such an important theme right now. And this is an early piece. Um, it's still very related to uh, my textiles in a way because it's on silk and 
um, there's a batik uh, in the background, um, and I've added um, Thermofax prints um, with textile ink onto the surface. So it's a layered piece. And in the process of um, thinking about this theme, I started to read a lot, which was really fun for me. I, I was never a good science student, and so um, I was very interested in botany and molecular forms. Um, and as I read, I started to read about evolution and, um, and extinctions. And um, it was just a lot of uh, fun to explore all this for my own reasons. Um, but there was also a challenge to it because the reading was very conceptual and I was trying to work visually so I was making lots and lots of lists um, from what, and taking notes and uh, getting ideas uh, that were very inspirational to me from the science I was reading but I was having trouble bringing it into a visual uh, experience and so I would jump between notes and uh, sketches. Another challenging part was that because I wanted to uh, unify the influences of both textiles and painting in this project, um, I started to work on felt, which was spackled, which was an idea I got from working in the program and also using the Thermofax. So I would paint onto the spackled felt and um, also Thermofax on it. And this was one of the first pieces I did um, really thinking about changing materials. It's still on a textile. The textile's been fused to felt with Misty Fuse, um, and I've uh, painted onto it. Um, actually, the drips are Thermofaxes, though I painted um, some drips in India ink and then made a screen out of it and uh, screened those in. Uh, but a lot of the background is just painted or... Um, improvisational printing. And this piece also is about um, extinction events. Um, there's a graph on the right that uh, is a graph of extinction events in the earth and the trilobites had a very long run a really long time ago. So I moved from the trilobites to uh, wanting to do for my last project um, a piece on coral. And my motivation was that uh, coral is very um, uh, graphic. Ex is a very graphic example of um, of climate change because coral is this beautiful color, but in the warm and polluted waters uh, of the ocean now, it gets bleached, and that seemed like a really good jumping off place to me. And I uh, started by sketching from uh, Google Images different kinds of coral. And, oops, that's a beautiful offering from Bali. <laughs> um, and uh, did some sketches, and then um, decided that I wanted to do a collage piece and not just paint into it. So I started to make paper collage and just paint. And then I made these movable collages from the paintings that I did and the drawings that I did. And I made screens from the white uh, paint on the black so that I could reproduce that in the collage. Uh, then I decided I wasn't ready to go straight to a final collage in any way. And I grabbed some scraps that had both been in purple dye baths and started to just execute the collage on the spackled surface. Um, so... Um, I actually also made uh, screens and then discovered I wanted the negative areas to be black, so I uh, masked, masking taped that area and painted in with textile paint. And then after having done that, I um, used transparencies that I had Thermofax on, and um, that's a good way to get a sense of scale and color while you're layering. And this is the final test piece. Um, I called it The Age of Fish. Uh, I liked it enough to give it a title. And then I decided to go back to the colors I was exploring in the movable collage um, and do another test piece. And so I wanted to paint uh, the 
collage pieces to get that watery feeling and did swatches for the watercolors and used this orange for contrast. And I was using raw silk. I had decided that that would be um, the right material. Um, and in this case, I painted everything black first with uh, some masking tape areas um, left out and started uh, cutting and pasting in the collage material and had a difficult time because actually the paint was hard to glue onto. Um, so I had to do a lot of sanding here. Um, and ended up with this piece um, as close to that collage as I could get. Um, and used the, had made the screens to do the white forms. Um, and in this case, I'm showing the transparencies that I was playing with, but I didn't actually uh, use those red transparencies in the end. And then again, I decided I had to do uh, a composition. And I chose the third one down for the final, final piece. Um, and this is two by six, actually. It's a painting um, of a small sketch for the final piece. And I wanted to stay very close to this piece. And this is what happened when I uh, finished it. Um, it was a little um, on the tight side. Uh, and though I like a lot of things about the piece, I wondered about being so controlled. But I felt, I guess, that I really needed to have control over the materials. Um, the only thing that wasn't um, in the other pieces is I I used a sharpie to put in these botanical forms on the left. And so I did some more designs. I did a lot of other designs. These are also two by sixes, little um, paintings on paper, to just get the feeling of looseness that I might apply to the next pieces. Uh, and so uh, I don't, I think I might have drawn uh, some unity for myself a little from the experience between the painting and the textiles. But I also got a lot of new ideas and I think I do feel more integrated about textiles and painting and uh, it was very satisfying to work in this way.